blessed to be here with you guys this morning. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2. And obviously we just celebrated Christmas and all that that means and coming together as family and, and, and just celebrating the birth of Christ, you know. And um, we don't want to just let it end there, right? We don't just want to think Christmas during Christmas time and, and move past that, you know. And so this morning, I want to look at a couple of the events that, that took place right after the birth of Christ, right? You know, this season, as I was kind of preparing and, and had the opportunity to share with all of you, I was like, all right, you know, I want to look at this chronologically. And last Sunday, we kind of looked at Mary, you know, before the birth of Christ and what she was looking at. And Christmas Eve, we, we uh, had a time to just look at the birth, you know, the birth of Jesus. And then Christmas morning, if you're able to join us online, we looked at Emmanuel and what it means that God is now with us and what that means in our lives. And so today, I just want to keep the calendar going and just look at these events that took place right after. And both of these events, they carry a really deep significance in our lives regarding the birth of Jesus Christ, and really what that birth means to us as Christians, not just once a year, not just during a season, but on an ongoing daily basis. And so imagine with me, if you will, it's been about a week since the birth of baby Jesus, a week since the angels filled the skies of Bethlehem horizon to horizon, really freaking out the shepherds there as they announced the birth of the Savior to those shepherds. It's been a week since those shepherds, after they were terrified and heard the message, ran and leaped and went all the way into Bethlehem to go see the fulfillment of what was said here. Mary, having, Mary, having hardly recovered from the ordeal, um, in her own right, you know, I imagine just the, the mental replay of the events, you know, going over and over in her mind, you know, the, the really forced journey to Bethlehem as they were required to do so by the, by the rulers of the time to go register for taxes and, you know, the frantic search for a place to give birth because she was full term, right? And so they arrive in Bethlehem and it's time and, you know, she goes into labor and it's like, we need a place to stay and nobody would give them uh, a place in their, in their guest room. And so they had to um, give birth out under the night sky in a, what was likely a very foul, smelly place with the animals to lay their baby in the feeding trough. And then Joseph, you know, just... Who knows what he was going through as a husband, right? You know, this situation is not probably how he planned it. And so, ah! But very unlike millions who down through the ages would just later give a cursory nod to the memory of Christmas briefly once a year, this couple, Mary and Joseph, lived their entire lives enveloped in the mystery of the birth of Jesus Christ. So this morning, like I said, I want to look at a couple of events that are associated with, with just some of the time after his birth. We're going to be looking at, you know, his circumcision, his baby dedication, and his naming, his official naming as Jesus, which all of it, it sh itself should really make the amazing wonder of Christmas, the amazing wonder that God would come to this earth to be born in flesh, not just a once a year experience for us, but a year long experience, an everyday experience as we reflect on the amazing wonder of what his birth meant for us. We're gonna see briefly the purification of Mary and Joseph, which is just gonna teach us this morning the right frame of mind to cultivate the right frame of mind to, to really remain in with which we then can live in this daily expectancy of Jesus being born and growing and just bearing fruit through our lives. We're also gonna see the presentation of baby Jesus in the temple, which is just gonna teach us and encourage us about the type of longing that we should endeavor to, to develop in our lives, the type of expectancy that really we're required to have as Christians to be living in a daily life, not just experiencing his birth, but looking forward every day to his return. And both that longing and expectancy, which is required, I believe, to really, truly experience the peace that Jesus has for us. And so let's pray, and uh, we'll get into it. Father, we, uh, we thank you so much. God, you came to this earth, Lord, born as a man, you lived a perfect life as a man. You were crucified on the cross for us. But God, then you were resurrected and you ascended to the right hand of the Father and sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within us. God, it is a wonder. 
It is an amazing thing to consider that you loved us so much, that you cared about us so much, that you would step out of your glory outside of time, outside of eternity, outside of creation, and to come be among us, with us, to be one of us, that you would identify with us, to understand the temptations we go through, to, to empathize with the, the difficulties and the struggles. And yet, Lord, you did it all. And that is a wonder, Lord, not for us to behold once a year, but every single day, God. That we would live lives that are longing for your presence every day, God. Desiring your presence every day. Knowing that you truly are with us, God, and that we would live in an urgent expectation of not just your work in our lives now, but looking forward to your coming again, Lord, where we would finally leave this world and all its difficulties and temptations and sin and just, just be with you in perfection forever in heaven. So God, encourage us this morning. Speak to us this morning, Lord. We love you so much, and we thank you for everything. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 2, picking it up in verse 21. It says, when the eight days were completed for his circumcision, he was named Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived. So it's just one simple verse here that, that describes this very important event. And, and it was important that he was circumcised as a baby because in Genesis chapter 17, we learn that circumcision was, was commanded for all males that were a part of the, the Jewish race, right? The Jewish ethnicity there. That all males were to be circumcised because that circumcision was a sign of the covenant that God had made with his covenant people, Right? That God had said, look, you are my people, I will be your God. And so in identification and acceptance and recognition of all that that means, circumcision was the sign. And the idea was that there was just a cutting away of ourselves, a cutting away of the flesh to be connected to God and what he wanted to do in our lives. And so Jesus was Jewish, right? And so in order to fully identify with his people, the Jewish people, he had to go through this because without this very important sign, he couldn't identify with his own Jewish people as their Messiah. And it didn't matter that they'd be biologically of Hebrew blood. It was an important thing. But it wasn't just him identifying with them as Jewish people. We're going to see later on that his identification, his coming, was for all of mankind. But the event of greatest significance at his circumcision was that he was officially named Jesus. Now names, they carry great meaning, especially in Hebrew culture. There was great, great meaning to names. You know, God speaks through names and uses names. I don't know if you've ever um, seen, Pastor Gary shared this uh, a number of times over the years, where if you go through the, the, the genealogy starting with Adam and you go all the way down through and all the way to Noah, there's this wonderful message when you just look at the meaning of the names. That is just God's plan of redemption planned from the very beginning of time. And, you know, names are important. We spend a lot of time thinking about names, right? If you go to Amazon.com, you will find literally millions of books on naming your baby. All kinds of different books, different strategies and thoughts and just lists of names, of, of naming babies. When my parents named me, they said, you know, everybody is named Scott, and everybody is named David. And, you know, there was all these common names at the time. And so they were like, we want a name that, that, that isn't very common. And so they got a baby naming book, and they found Nathan, right? We don't know anybody that has a kid named Nathan. We're going to pick that, right? And then when my brother came along, they were like, well, we got to stick with the, the theme of the letter N, and they named him Norman, right? I think I won between the two. But, um, but growing up, you know, I think until I graduated high school, I could count on one hand how many Nathans I ever met and ran into, right? And so, of course, I always thought, wow, my name's special. It has special meaning, you know? And some people think that names could be prophetic of their life, you know? And it's, it was something that was especially common in Hebrew culture. And, and, and to be quite honest, you know, some people get crazy with naming their kid, right? They, they, they come up with, 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 strange, weird, highly unusual names, you know, to name their child. And, and I think the result of, of that is that many countries have actual laws in place on what you can and can't name your kid, you know, because, um, you know, you have people like, uh, I don't know if you guys remember the artist uh, Prince, who uh, at a certain time in his career decided to change his name to some weird symbol, right? 
that's my name now. And it's just some, you know, some scribble on a piece of paper. Well, well, you know, what did everybody continue to call him? The artist formerly known as Prince, right? <laughs> they still stuck with the name because, how, you know, people were like, you know, I got to be able to call you something. You know, the United States, ha- incidentally, is, has some of the most lax naming rules of countries around the world. And, you know, it's just people just have fun with it, I guess, you know. But um, most of us are at least interested with the meaning of names, you know, I've told this story before, but, you know, when I was in high school, um, me and my friends used to go to Knott's Berry Farm, and they, they had these little bookmarks in one of their stores, and, and I don't know if you've ever seen this at places where they have these, these rows of bookmarks that have names, and they have all the meanings of the names on them, right? And so I was like, oh, let me find Nathan, because Nathan was uncommon. So you never find a bookmark with Nathan on it, you know? And so I, they had one, and I was like, oh, man, and I look at it, and it said, the name Nathan means given or gift of God. And I went, wow, that's a great pickup line. So I walked around Knott's Berry Farm, and hey, hey, you know what my name means, you know? <laughs> Didn't work, was a terrible pickup line, um, but I tried, you know. Anyways, the naming of Jesus was a very, very important moment. You see, the name Jesus essentially means Yahweh is salvation, or Yahweh saves, or the Lord is salvation, depending on, on, on the renderings of it. But that's what Jesus means, and grasping the meaning of his name and how it was prophetically told, this is what you're going to name him. Grasping the meaning of all that is really essential to understanding um, the impact of his birth. You know, I think the average person on the street has no idea what the meaning of the name Jesus is. But for us that know, we know, we've experienced that it is both a claim and a promise. It is a claim about who he is. It is a promise about what he came to do and the desire that he has for our lives. The origin of the name Jesus, which is really interesting, reveals something that I think makes it even more precious because Jesus, um, and that's the English rendering, but Jesus is the Greek version of the Hebrew name Yeshua, all right? Now, the English spelling of the name Yeshua gives us the name Joshua. We're familiar with the name Joshua, right? But it's interesting. So the, the, the naming of Jesus and Yeshua, or Jesus and Joshua, the, the meaning is the same there, right? The Lord is salvation. But if you think of the name Joshua, it was a common Hebrew name. But if you think back to the Old Testament, you might think of the book of Joshua, right? The one who served uh, under Moses and ended up taking, uh, taking place, becoming a great leader after Moses died. Joshua, we know in the book of Joshua and from the Old Testament, was this, this great general, this great leader that led Israel into the promised land. But it's interesting, if you go back and look at Joshua in the Old Testament, you'll find that his name wasn't originally Joshua. His original name was Hosea. And Hosea means, depending on your rendering and stuff, but the best one I could find was literally God save. That's what Hosea meant. So it was kind of like an expression of a desire for salvation, right? Um, But what's interesting is because of Hosea's faith, because of his leadership in believing that the promised land could indeed be conquered when everybody else was like, no way, there's giants there. Because of all that, in Numbers chapter 13, verse 16, it tells us that Moses renamed Hosea Joshua. Moses renamed him. So what we find there is that there was this moment in his life where Moses said, look, you, you trust God so much. You trust that, that God's going to give us the promised land even though everybody else is doubting it. You know what? I'm going to change your name from God save to the Lord is salvation. Pretty interesting name change. And he obviously went on to become Israel's greatest general, leading them into the promised land. And so looking at kind of like a, a, a following, you know, a, an origin of the name, so to speak, you have Jesus which is Greek for Joshua, not only means the Lord is salvation, but, but when you tra- trace it back to Joshua and his stuff, you kind of see this type of Jesus, obviously, in the life of Jesus and his deliverance, and you see that not only does it mean the Lord is salvation, but there's also this idea of being delivered by heroic action, being delivered by heroic action. And for us as believers, we know that Jesus came into our lives, the Lord is salvation, and he very heroically delivered us from the bondage of sin. 
So the name Jesus shouts to the world, proclaims to all that would hear it, the heroics of his birth, which is a miracle in and of itself, and the heroics of his death on the cross and our redemption. And that was his point. That was the very reason of God coming to this earth, to redeem mankind, right? It is the very theme of the whole thing here. You remember both Mary and Joseph were told separately that the child that she was going to uh, give birth to was to be named Jesus. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, the angel speaking to Joseph said, she will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins, right? And then in Luke chapter 1, verse 31, Gabriel talking to Mary said, now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. Now, do you think that Mary and Joseph like pondered this, you know, as she was pregnant and after this proclamation and leading up to the birth, you know, his name to be Jesus. You think they talked about this in, in the week leading up to the birth of Jesus? You know, you imagine when the time came, and they knew what the word Jesus meant, what, what the name Jesus meant. When the time came to utter that divinely given name, I imagine just the sheer gravity of the implication must have overwhelmed them that our baby is going to be named the Lord is Salvation. This child, our baby, is salvation. He is our deliverance. How wonderful, how, how amazing. And that's it, that Jesus, the one who is named the Lord is salvation, the one who is our deliverance, if this understanding of, of who Jesus is and what his name means, if this understanding is not a part of our daily mindset, if it's not a part of our daily wonder when we think, wow, God was born into this earth. He is, he is my salvation. He is my deliverer. He has set me free. If, if it's not a part of our regular thinking, maybe you haven't met him yet. Maybe you haven't had that moment of where it just hits you what it means with who he is. John Newton said, how sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. That's why in our worship, we have songs that just proclaim the name of Jesus and talk about Jesus. And we say that name Jesus over and over because it is such a sweet name and a sweet sound in our ears. The weight of the implication, the meaning of his name in our lives really should be something we reflect on and meditate on. Not just once a year, right? It's easy to have Jesus on the brain, you know, when we're like Christmas time, and right, especially as Christians, right? He's the, he's the reason for the season. He's the, the meaning of the whole thing, and, and we want to make sure, you know, we get the opportunity to share with people that, that, you know, Christmas isn't just gifts and reindeer and snowmen. No, it's the birth of Jesus, right? But every single day it is something that, that we should reflect on and meditate on what that name means in our life. So the next couple events in his life, he was circumcised, he was named officially according to the prophecy and what was given to them. The next couple events took place a couple months later, about a month or so, depending on your chronology. But look in Luke chapter 2, verse 22. It says, when the days of their purification according to the law of Moses were finished, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Just as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now I want to touch real quick just on the offering that Mary and Joseph brought there, right? Because according to Leviticus chapter 12, verses 6 and 8, according to the Jewish law, um, after a, a, a mother, a mom gave birth to her son, um, the, they were required to come and, 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 and offer, bring an offering to the temple in order to be ceremonially, <laughs> declared ceremonially, I can't say that today, clean, purified, okay? Um, and so they were told according to the law that they were to bring a one-year-old lamb and a young turtle dove to be offered up as a sacrifice. But if you couldn't afford the lamb you were then allowed to bring two young doves. And that's exactly what they bring. 
Mary and Joseph offering um, is just, again, a picture of their poverty, a picture of their, of their state, that they're, they're poor, they're not rich, they're not wealthy, they're not of great influence, you know. And then this, this offering that they would bring um, was a public offering. It was something that, that just everybody saw. It was done there in the temple in front of everybody. And again, um, we see where Christianity began and where it always begins, in the life that recognizes its need, in a life that recognizes its poverty, a, re- a life that recognizes its spiritual poverty, a life of humility. That is where God is birthed. Mary proclaimed her understanding of this in Luke chapter 1, verse 48, when she said, he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. We saw this when the angels gave their message to the outcast shepherds, right? The shepherds who were only allowed as close to the city as they were because they tended the sheep that people needed for sacrifices. But at the time, they were considered just lower than low, and so, but that's who the angel came to. That was the first people the angel came to to say, look, the Savior has been born. Coming to the shepherds instead of the high and mighty of Israel, instead of the rich and wealthy and those of great influence, The wretched circumstances of the birth of Jesus, again in Psalm chapter 34, verse 18, echoed this reality. It says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and he saved those who are crushed in spirit. You know, as they came to present their son to the Lord, they they, they had nothing but gave what they had and, and that's a humility, that's a posture that I think is required The Lord offers himself to everybody, but those that receive God come with a posture of humility, of accepting that that, that what he said is true, who he said he is is true, and what he came to do is true, and and, and I need that. I need his grace. I need his mercy. This is a paramount understanding for the saved and the unsaved because it's this frame of mind, this humility that allows you to live daily in the wow of what the birth of Jesus means. This frame of mind, this humble frame of mind is what allows us to live daily receiving the blessing and the benefit of the birth of Christ in our life. Not just one day a year, but every single day of the year. This mindset is a total embrace of our complete, ongoing spiritual poverty. Embrace it. And when we embrace it, every day, we will have the opportunity to reflect on the birth of God in the flesh, named Jesus, who is our salvation, our deliverer. Because to be quite honest, I don't know about you, but I know I need salvation and deliverance every day, not just one day of the year. Now, if you misunderstand Christianity, I believe you'll develop a wrong sense of personal spiritual adequacy. If you misunderstand what this is all about. Even the born again can sometimes turn spiritual progress into a a prideful self-sufficiency. Even we can find ourselves turning, turning, you know, growth and maturity into something where we get to the place where we say, oh, I don't need Jesus as much anymore. That was great in December. Yeah, hallelujah, birth of Jesus, woohoo! But now it's February, March, whatever, you know. Gosh, I've read my devotional three whole times. I'm good. You know? I pray here and there. I, I, I don't need his presence in my life as much as maybe I did before. And, and we should never lose sight of our deep, pervasive, daily spiritual need. We should never lose sight of the spiritual poverty that, that, our, that our sinful selves exist in. And I'm not saying that we should live lives where we just wallow in how bad we are all the time. That's not my point. The point is to never forget reflecting through remembering what Jesus means of why he had to come. Because we need him. We need him so desperately. And so while Mary and Joseph were in the temple bringing Jesus to be dedicated, they met two other Israelites whose lives are also great examples of faith and godliness. 
Verse 25 of Luke chapter 2, it says, There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation. Another translation says, looking forward to the one who would comfort Israel. And it says, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And then in verse 36, it says, there was also a prophetess, Anna, a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was well along in years, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow for 84 years. She did not leave the temple, serving God night and day with fasting and prayers. So these two people that were there when Mary and Joseph showed up to to dedicate their baby, these two people embodied, I think, everything that was good with with the religiousness of, of, of Israelites at the time, everything that was good about it. And really, to those who follow Christ today, the similarities between both of them that we're gonna look at here in a second are a big challenge to us and a huge encouragement to us in living the daily experience of the wonder of the birth of Christ and really how that results in peace on a daily basis. The first thing we notice about them, verse 25 and verse 37, um, is that they were both devoted to God. They were devoted, right? Verse 25, it says about Simeon, this man was righteous and devout. That means that he lived his life in such a way that he carefully intentionally honored God, that he lived his life in such a way where he represented God rightly in his behavior, how he talked to people, how he talked to his friends, how he talked to his family, how he talked to his kids, his spouse, you know, all that stuff. Everything he did, he was very careful and intentional to make sure that he honored God properly in his behavior. And then verse 37, it tells us about Anna that she did not leave the temple serving God night and day with fasting and prayers. And so we see a woman, whenever the doors of the temple were open, right? She was there worshiping. She was there serving God. They were very devout. The second thing we learn about them is that they were both prophets. Again, in verses 29 through 32, we get Simeon's song, which we're going to look at in a moment, which was very prophetic. And then in verse 36, it straight up tells us that Anna was called a prophetess. Now, you may or may not exercise the gift of prophecy in your life, and you may or may not, you know, be called to be a prophet. But at the very least, prophecy is the concept of knowing God's word and speaking forth God's word speaking forth the truth of God's word into people's lives. And at the very least, both of them did that. I believe there was more to their particular prophetic ministry. But the example that they set for us is that there were two people that knew God's word and spoke God's word. And then the third thing we see about them is that they were both filled with expectancy. Verse 25 tells us that Simeon was looking forward to Israel's consolation. And then verse 38, it tells us right after Simeon gives this song, this prophetic utterance and song that he he says, verse 38, it goes, at that very moment, Anna came up and began to thank God and to speak about him to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. That to me implies that that as, as Simeon would come to the temple and as he was looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, that, that she in some way knew him or recognized him or was a part of that whole looking forward to the consolation of Israel because she was in the temple every single day praying and fasting. But the picture here is that these two never gave up. They kept patiently trusting kept patiently looking forward to, kept patiently expecting God to show up. And that's a great example for us today, right? We get to the Christmas season, and and we're looking forward to Christmas, right? And we're like, oh, birth of Jesus, birth of Jesus, baby Jesus is so awesome. And then we get to Christmas, and woo, birth of Jesus and a whole lot of food and gifts. Woo, it's awesome, right? And And then it's like, okay, and then we start to move on. Okay, well, now New Year's is coming up, and, 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 and sometimes we can be tempted to, to, to let the foot off the gas pedal of that expecting, that, that expectation, that looking forward to and longing for Jesus to show up in our life every single day. 
this looking for, this longing for, this expecting Jesus to show up daily um, and, and, and having this humble mind and following these examples, I believe it's key. It's key to us experiencing the peace that surpasses all understanding. If I have at the forefront of my thinking that God showed up and he is here and he's gonna show up today, well, then I could get through this day just fine. If I'm thinking that God is going to show up and I'm, and I'm looking forward to that with the same expectancy as I do at Christmas time and I do that every day of my life, it's key to getting through each day's challenges and struggles with victory. But with the peace that says, I know God's in control. I know God's going to be able to handle it. I know he's going to take care of it. You may not know the details, but this daily longing for and this daily expectation of Jesus to show up brings us peace. Brings us peace. Simeon and Anna, they represent all who would, who would see. And all who would see that our only hope in life is in the mercy and the grace of God. That's our only hope. Along with a poor carpenter, along with his young wife, along with these outcast shepherds, Simeon and Anna to me are flesh and blood examples of the type of people who Christ comes to. The type of people who are ready and willing with the right frame of mind to not only receive Christ, but to then have the fruit of that relationship blossom and grow out of their lives. And I think lives like these, in many ways, are becoming rarer and rarer as our world gets darker and darker. You know, if we don't daily, if we don't see daily our insufficiency in and of ourselves, if we don't recognize that every single day, we fall into the I'm good trap. I'm good trap. You know, when it comes to studying the word, I'm good. I already went to Bible study this week. When it comes to worshiping God, I'm good. I sing a song on Sunday. When it comes to sharing the gospel, I'm good. I gave out a track last month, or it's not my calling anyways. I'm not an evangelist. When it comes to real self-challenge, right, reflection, real change to become more like Christ, really, truly, like, addressing those things head on that are, that are really rough edges and things in our lives that aren't glorifying to God, I'm good. After all, I'm not as bad as that person. I don't need to change until they change. And that's not the biblical thinking that, that, that we're to, to, to follow. The I'm good trap ultimately will lead us back into getting drunk, doing drugs, being angry, lashing out with hurtful and unkind things, will lead us back into all manner of sins, back into pornography, back into lust, back into sleeping around, back into lying, back into cheating, back into stealing. Because the second we think, I don't need God, we're doomed. We're doomed. I mean, just go back and think about how you were before you had God in your life. How are you doing? Well, there was something up that brought us to a place of saying, wow, I need God, right? You weren't hitting the ball out of the park. And so then to come to that place and say, I need God, and to somehow fall into the place of saying, I'm good, I don't need him as much anymore. Wow, what a deception that is. And it is straight from the pit of hell. The I'm good trap leads us back into sin. It leads us into separating from fellowship, separating from worship. We read less. We pray less. We worship less. We find ourselves not listening to the still small voice of God anymore. And we're like, you know, I'm just, I, 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 I don't need it as much. And we may not say that I don't need God out front, but our actions will then belay that. And this happens, I think, in people's lives because although we might be doing well in one area of our life, we let go of our daily awareness that we need Jesus in every area of our life. And we need him in every moment of every single day. We let go of that longing for righteousness, longing for the comfort that only comes from him. We lose our humility and replace it with a prideful self-assurance and then one day we look up and we say, where did God go? Where did he go? 
And we wonder why we don't want to do what he wants us to do anymore. We wonder why we don't want to let him lead. We wonder why we've lost our peace and lost our joy and lost our contentment. You know, I think what grace would come to us if we just dared pray for a greater sense of our spiritual need every single day. And I think God is just waiting for us to pray those prayers. He's there every day. We know that. He's with us every day. But sometimes we block him out with our own arrogance. And we lose the wonder of what the birth of Christ means, what his name Jesus means, what it means to our life in every single moment. There's another facet to Simeon that I want to look at. Verse 26 in Luke 2, it says, It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. So this man, Simeon, had received a word from God, right? God had told them that, that you're not going to die, you're not going to leave this life until you see the Messiah, the Savior come into the world. And, you know, how long had, be, had, been, how long had he been waiting for this? You know, days, months, years, we don't know. You know, it's interesting, often in, in the past when I've read this story, I've always pictured Simeon as an old man, Right? It tells us of Anna, right, you know, before that, I think in a very smart way, it said she is well along in years, right? It didn't say she's an old lady. She's well along in years, right? Very respectful in that sense. But, but it tells us that, that, that she, was, she was very advanced in age, and some um, uh, scholars and stuff think that she was maybe between 103 to 108 years at that time. But there's actually no detail whatsoever about Simeon's age at all in the Scripture, some people look at this and they go, oh, they interpret this as, as he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. And then obviously when he finally saw him, he was so excited. And so they go, oh, he must have been waiting a long time. It's possible. But, but the scripture doesn't tell us that. What we do know about Simeon is that regardless whether he was old, whether he was young, whether he'd been waiting a really long time or not such a long time, he didn't quit believing because it was taken longer than he would like. He didn't stop believing that the Messiah was going to show up because it didn't happen right away. It didn't happen the second he got that word from the Lord. And that's a huge truth. God always fulfills his promises. If God's given you a word, God will fulfill that word. Both Simeon and Anna show us that, that never quitting, never giving up, never letting go of what God has spoken to you leads to blessing. It leads to blessing. Reflecting on that regularly, not, not putting it to the side, not letting the wonder of what God has said, oh, okay, we'll deal with that again next year. No, but having that as an everyday part of your life, it leads to blessing. And for me, I can imagine Simeon coming into the temple. God had spoken to him, hey, dude, you're not going to die until you see the Messiah, right? I mean, what great confidence would that build in somebody, right? You know, he's like, oh, I'm standing in the road, and, you know, here comes the, the horses. You know, I can't die. I haven't seen the Messiah. I don't know if that's how he lived his life, you know. I'm going to jump off this building. No, you know, none of that's in Scripture. I'm just, you know. But the point is, is he lived with confidence. God spoke to me. I'm going to trust in that promise every day. Because God spoke, and it's going to happen. And you can imagine his confident hope and his joyous anticipation anticipa Anticipa anticipation. There we go. I got it. Wow. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, you could clap for that. All right. Anticipation. Every time he entered the temple, is it today? Is today the day I'm going to see the Lord, right? Looking around, you know, a young couple walks in with a baby to dedicate. Oh, is that them? Nope. Okay, next couple. Is that them? I mean, he was just so eager, so excited for that moment where he would meet the Messiah. And then one wonderful day, it says in verse 27, guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms and praised God. You know, with excited arms, Simeon lifted up what, what I don't know why, but in my head is this cute little chubby dimpled baby, right? No idea if that's what baby Jesus looked like, but that, I just have that image in my head, but he picked him up. You know, and I imagine, you know, he just took him out of the arms and Mary, possibly startled, who knows, but, but for a moment, 
In Simeon's life, for a moment, the world just stopped. And that is the moment that we all experience when you know the Messiah, the Savior, has come into my life. God has shown up just as he said he was going to. That moment of joy as he held the baby, knowing who it was, and I believe it was because the Spirit led him there, and the Spirit, I believe, spoke to him and said, this is the one. He began to praise God in song, and in his song, I'm going to look at that as we close, it lays down the, the, the purpose of this Christ child. Not just for Joseph and Mary, but for all of us. Look at verse 29. He says, now, Master, speaking to God, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised for my eyes have seen your salvation you have prepared it in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the gentiles and glory to your people israel and so with the baby secure in his arms simeon sure feeling secure in god's presence he experienced a profound peace in his soul he held in his hands the prophesied prince of peace, as it says in Isaiah 9, 6. My salvation has shown up. And so then he says, I'm ready to pass on, right? Now you can dismiss your servant. Basically the idea is I could die now because I've received everything I need. The Savior has arrived. And that's exactly why he's like, look, you could dismiss me for my eyes have seen your salvation. It's an interesting phrase there because he goes, when I've seen your salvation, it doesn't mean I've seen part of it. It doesn't seem I've just, mean I've just seen the beginning of it. It means I've seen all of it. I've seen all of it, all of your salvation. Christ is totally and completely sufficient for us. He is all we need. He is complete and totally sufficient for our salvation. He is complete and totally sufficient for our deliverance. He is everything, and true peace, I believe, only comes. True peace, lasting peace, only comes when we understand, just like Simeon understood, that salvation, true salvation and deliverance is Jesus plus nothing. It's not Jesus plus someone's book club. It's not Jesus plus this great preacher or pastor. It's not Jesus plus, it's Jesus plus nothing. The salvation that he's singing about, it's universal in its offer. Look what it says in verse 31. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples. That means everybody. A light for revelation to the Gentiles. Not just the Jews, but also to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. This is especially significant for us that aren't Jewish, right? If you're not Jewish, you fall under the umbrella of Gentile. Here's what I want you to understand. At the birth of Jesus, and, and, and in these days after, as he was, he was dedicated and committed, and, and all that's taking place here. We, the non-Jewish people in this world, we were sung about in the temple by a Jewish prophet as he held the Messiah in his arms. We were sung about. How glorious. Jesus truly is our light in this ever-darkening world. He is our salvation. Not just Israel's, theirs too, but also ours. And so his excitement and his behavior, I mean, it paints a really beautiful picture for me. You know, you have this guy holding this baby tightly in his arms, looking him over and over, Right? heart overflowing with joy at the coming of the long-awaited Savior, the joy he's experiencing at the fulfillment of God's personal promises to him, and I think that is exactly how to receive salvation. You simply take Jesus into your arms as Lord. You simply receive him as Savior. That's all it takes to be saved. That's all it takes to receive the blessing of salvation. You don't have to jump through hoops or do this or take a class or fill out a form. You just receive him. 
And sure, we, we remember that at Christmas time, right? Because we talk about gifts and you gotta receive gifts. But, but this is a truth and reality every single day of our lives. To not just receive him and the salvation, but the deliverance we need on a daily basis. You just have to receive it. I can imagine the thoughts that must, must have gone through Mary and Joseph's mind. You know, our baby. His name is the Lord is Salvation. The thoughts that they went through their mind as, as they saw that, that, that he was and that he is. To contemplate that he is the Messiah. He's the mighty deliverer of all mankind. And he does just that. He delivers, delivers us through the heroics of his birth, but also the heroics on the cross. And those heroics continue in our lives every single day as we walk with him. He saves us and delivers us from the bondage of sin, He saves us and delivers us from the devastation it causes. Not just initially in the point where you are saved forever, you're going to heaven, you are washed clean by the blood of Christ, but every single day as we long for him and expect him and receive him, he sets us free from those things if we let him. He comes to those who realize that he is their only hope. Just like Mary and Joseph, the shepherds, Simeon, Anna, It's those with an ongoing sense of their spiritual need. It's those with an ongoing sense of their spiritual hunger who are blessed to live in this ongoing wonder every day of what the birth of God in the flesh means. And for those of us that have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, those that have realized and accepted that Jesus is the whole of salvation, that it's Jesus plus nothing, we find peace. And the Bible talks about this peace. It's a peace that can't be explained. It's a peace that doesn't make sense to a lost and dying world. It's a peace that oftentimes, if I'm just being honest with you, doesn't even make sense to us sometimes. How am I at peace in the midst of what I'm dealing with? But it's because he is the Prince of Peace. Jesus plus nothing. If you don't know him this morning in this room or you're watching online, I encourage you to accept him this morning as your Lord and Savior. I encourage you just to reach out your arms and receive him. Because he wants peace for your life. He wants to bring peace into your life. And he's been trying to tell you this morning that all of your efforts on your own to find peace have ultimately resulted in a lack of peace. He is what you need. The salvation, the forgiveness of God, the Holy Spirit to dwell in your life and to transform you from the inside out, that is exactly what you need today. And God offers it to you. He is the only one that could save you from the penalty of sin, He is the only one that could deliver you from the bondage, the slavery to sin. He is the only one that could give you true peace. It's why he was born. It's why he lived. It's why he died on the cross. Jesus, the Lord is salvation, our deliverer. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you've done. God, we thank you, Lord, that you came to this earth and were born as a man. God, we thank you that you were not just born as a man, but you were born in really deplorable conditions, God. Because some of us, our lives are deplorable conditions. And Lord, I believe those are, there are those here, maybe in this room or online or both, God, who have recognized this morning that you desire to be born into their life but not just as a one-time event, God. You desire to be born into their life and then to work in and through their lives daily, to show up on their behalf daily, to teach them, to mold them, to shape them, to encourage them, to save them, to protect them, and to deliver them. Lord, we are so thankful for that work. May we never forget it. May we reflect on it every single day, Lord. May we take time to never lose the wonder of what Christmas means every day of the year. And while we're praying with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're in this room this morning or if you're online and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, 
that you've never said, God, come into my life, save my soul, if you've never received that gift and you have been trying to live your life seeking peace but ultimately never finding it, I believe God is speaking to you this morning. So if you're in this room and you want to receive Christ this morning and if you're online watching, I'm just going to lead you in a prayer right now. And there's no specific effect of you got to say these exact words. This is just a prayer from the heart talking to God Almighty about who you are, what you need, and your desire for him to work in your life. And so pray with me now if you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Say, Lord God, I believe today that you are God. I believe today that you came to this earth 2,000 years ago and were born as a man named Jesus Christ. I believe you lived a life free from sin and died on the cross for me. I believe you are my salvation. I believe you are my deliverer. And so save my soul, Lord. Help me to find the peace that surpasses all understanding. Teach me how to live for you with longing, with expectancy, with expectation that you'll be in my life every single day from this day forward until the day I'm with you in heaven. Thank you for loving me so much. It's in your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer today um, and you're here in the room, we, we want to help you guys on the next step, right? You didn't join a church. You didn't join a religion. You've established a relationship with your creator. And of course, here at Hosanna, we want to help you in that relationship. And we want to help you in that walk as you grow and mature in your faith and your relationship with God. So we have some new believers packs, little manila envelopes up front. If you received Christ today, please come forward after we're done worshiping. Um, I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to give you one of these uh, new believers packs. If you're online and you accepted Christ this morning, uh, congratulations to all of you, you know? Yeah, it's... Your life will never be the same. It won't be perfect. The devil's mad. To be quite honest, he's going to mess with you <laughs> because he's mad at you, because you're not his anymore. But he'll never defeat you because God Almighty dwells within you. And so if you're here, come forward to get one of these New Believers packets. If you're online, please just let us know in chat that you gave your life to the Lord. Um, let our chat moderators know, and we'll make sure that we get you one of these. Please don't type your address in the chat there. We don't want the whole world to have your personal address, but we'll uh, private message you, and we'll get this new believers pack to you. And I just encourage all of us, you know, Christmas was yesterday. Hallelujah. Praise God for the birth of Jesus, right? But today is the day after Christmas. Hallelujah. Praise God for the birth of Jesus. Let's move forward in that longing and that expectancy to watch God work in and through us every day. Never forget to expect God to show up on your behalf because he will. He is your child. You know, if you've got stuff in your life that, that, that has been getting in the way of that, I encourage you to seek out your brothers and sisters. Come forward after service, whatever. Let us pray with you. You know, because prayer breaks the bondage of things as we seek God's work on our behalf, and he wants to do that, not just yesterday, not just today, but every single day of the rest of your life. God bless you guys.